All right, so let's wrap up Lecture 13, shall we? The first, well, about half of the citric acid cycle will be covered in this chunk. But hopefully so far you have a pretty good feeling about glycolysis and where we left that process off. The overall role of the citric acid cycle in metabolism in general, but in glucose metabolism more specifically. And hopefully you also have a good general sense of where we are going in this process, a good bird's eye view of what we're going to be doing. And finally, uh, most importantly, perhaps you understand how we converted pyruvate into acetyl-CoA using the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Now that we have made acetyl-CoA, we are ready to go into the nitty-gritty of the citric acid cycle itself, and so let's just dive right in. We've made acetyl-CoA. We have a two-carbon molecule acetyl-CoA. It is reactive, linked to CoA through that highly reactive thiol group, so we are ready to start. We already mentioned oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate is the first intermediate, or more often referred to as the resident intermediate, of the citric acid cycle. This is our way into the cycle. And the cell controls the speed or the efficiency of the citric acid cycle largely by controlling how much oxaloacetate is around. So if the cell removes oxaloacetate, you just can't run as many citric acid cycles at any one time. And so the speed and efficiency of the citric acid cycle goes down. Conversely, if the cell needs more energy, one way it could speed the entire process up is by just making more oxaloacetate. More oxaloacetate means more acetyl can be processed in any one moment, and that means more electrons can be harvested and more ATP made. So in step one of the citric acid cycle, the acetyl group is going to be unlinked from CoA and transferred to oxaloacetate, making the six carbon molecule citrate and releasing CoA so that it can go and pick up another acetyl from the PDC. So the overall reaction of step one of the citric acid cycle is once again, Oxaloacetate and acetyl-CoA come together and create citrate, which has four carbons in it, as well as CoA on its own. You can see the enzyme responsible for catalyzing this reaction is called citrate synthase. That's a really good name for the enzyme. Uh, synthase, of course, suggests that this enzyme makes something. What the enzyme makes is citrate, so it's a good name. Uh, one quick thing, though, on synthase as a term we have two enzyme types or two enzyme names that suggest the synthesis of something. We have synthases and we have synthetases. Any enzyme name that has in it synthetase is an enzyme that makes a biomolecule using energy from ATP. Any enzyme name that has the name synthase does not need energy from ATP to do its job. Citrate synthase makes citrate and it doesn't need ATP to do it. This is a condensation reaction. We're making a carbon-carbon bond between the carbon of acetyl and the carbon of oxaloacetate. This is actually a two-step process. I won't ever ask you to know the two individual steps, but just to fill in the gaps and give you the full story. In the first half of this reaction, oxaloacetate joins up with acetyl, and CoA is still stuck onto that acetyl. This creates an intermediate called citril-CoA. Very soon after, the CoA group is cleaved away, releasing CoA and leaving us with citrate. I already told you the enzyme responsible for this is citrate synthase. This reaction is energy releasing because there's so much energy pent up in that CoA bond, that thiol group bond. And that is the energy that we use to do the synthesis reaction. The reason why we don't need ATP, the reason why this is a synthase enzyme, is because the energy needed comes from the release of CoA. This is going to be our roadmap for the citric acid cycle in general, and we just discussed step one. Acetyl is coming into the process through uh, the PDC. This is, again, the acetyl that we made from pyruvate. It is linking up with oxaloacetate, giving us citrate. CoA is released to go and repeat another linkage to acetyl. Step two is the isomerization of, cit of citrate to isocitrate isomerized citrate, isocitrate. And the enzyme responsible for catalyzing step two is aconitase. Now I should say at this point, I do not expect you to know all of the enzymes of the citric acid cycle the way I wanted you to know the enzymes of glycolysis. What I do expect you to know about the citric acid cycle is the general outcome of each step. In other words, what is each step accomplishing? What is each step for? So to summarize what I mean in these first two steps, know that step one 
is used to link acetyl to um, oxaloacetate, bringing acetyl into the cycle. Know that step two is an isomerization reaction. Know that steps three and four are oxidative decarboxylations. We'll see that in just a moment. So know the generalities of each step and why they're important to the cycle as a whole. So we can summarize step two in this way. We start with citrate. We move a bunch of groups around. We isomerize citrate into isocitrate. And again, aconitase is the enzyme responsible for that. This isomerization makes citrate, which is actually not chiral, into isocitrate, which is chiral. And so the main role or goal of aconitase is to introduce that chiral asymmetry. By doing, uh, in doing that, what aconitase is doing is removing a water molecule and then putting that water molecule back on in a different way. By holding citrate in a very non-symmetrical way, removing that water molecule and putting it on differently, aconitase introduces chirality into isocitrate. Now this is important because the isocitrate that we make is in the L form. And I already told you that intermediates of the citric acid cycle are used for anabolism. I also told you that um, alpha-ketoglutarate, an intermediate that we will meet soon, is one of the primary precursors for amino acid biosynthesis. Amino acids, which are in fact chiral and only come in the L form. So by introducing the chirality, in the same way for every isocitrate molecule and making every single isocitrate in the L form, we are setting the stage for all of our amino acids being in the L form as well. But for the purposes of the citric acid cycle, step two is merely the isomerization of citrate into isocitrate catalyzed by aconitase. Step three, again, is our first of two successive oxidative decarboxylation events, which will convert isocitrate into alpha-ketoglutarate. No surprise, since this is a decarboxylation reaction, that carbon dioxide is going to be released. And if it's an oxidative decarboxylation, we have to expect the theft of electrons and protons as well. And in fact, that's what we see. It is the redox reaction that occurs first. Electrons and protons are ripped from isocitrate. What we are left with is an intermediate form which rapidly and spontaneously decarboxylates into alpha-ketoglutarate. So first we steal the electrons and protons, and then carbon dioxide essentially pops off all on its own. The enzyme responsible for this is isocitrate dehydrogenase, a wonderful name for this enzyme, describes exactly what it does. And again, we go through this unstable intermediate where carbon dioxide spontaneously decarboxylates on its own. Step three ends with alpha-ketoglutarate, one of the primary precursors for amino acid biosynthesis, which is in its L form, of course, because of the chirality that we introduced in step two. This is our, also our first bona fide redox reaction within the citric acid cycle itself. It is NAD plus that accepted the electrons and protons that we harvested, reducing it to NADH plus H. And just as we saw for the PDC, this NADH plus H as a mobile electron carrier will shuttle those electrons over to the electron transport chain where they can be eventually and indirectly used to make ATP. That's the grand goal of everything we're doing is to eventually make ATP by the bucketful. I also want to point out here before we get too deeply in the nitty gritty that we're actually doing two of these steps for every molecule of glucose we consume. I want you to think for a moment about why that might be. Well, remember, for every one molecule of glucose we consumed, we made two pyruvates, which allowed us to make two acetyl-CoA's, which fed into two citric acid cycles in parallel, making us two citrates, isomerized into two isocitrates, and then decarboxylated into two alpha-ketoglutarates. So everything, everything from the moment of the isomerization of dehaptic gap in glycolysis, everything we are doing, we are doing in parallel for every one glucose molecule consumed. It's important to keep that in the back of your mind. Step three of the citric acid cycle. Again, the oxidative decarboxylation of isocitrate into alpha-ketoglutarate resulting in the release of carbon dioxide and the reduction of NAD to NADH plus H. And then we do it again. Step four is another oxidative decarboxylation. 
Once again, we are going to steal electrons and protons from alpha ketoglutarate, and once again, that theft is going to result in the decarboxylation of that molecule. We see here that alpha ketoglutarate becomes succinyl CoA. NAD plus is there waiting for the electrons that it will receive and then shuttle over to the PDC, and carbon dioxide is released. This is the last carbon dioxide from glucose. We lost two carbon dioxides as we made two acetyls from glucose. We just lost two more carbon dioxides as we did two step threes. And here we lose the last two carbon dioxides in our parallel step fours, giving us all six carbons of the six carbon sugar glucose that we started with. Glucose is gone. You might notice some other things that look familiar here in this reaction scheme. We see TPP, we see lipoic acid, we see FAD. These look familiar. And in fact, it's true that the complex that catalyzes this reaction, called alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex, more commonly referred to as the KDC, the ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex, um, essentially this complex looks like and behaves just like the PDC. We make succinyl-CoA in a very similar fashion as to how we made acetyl-CoA. Uh, we link intermediates to TPP and then to lipoic acid. It's lipoic acid that's responsible for the redox reaction. They go to FAD first, the electrons do, and then they're offloaded to NAD. So essentially everything we said about the PDC applies to the ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex as well. The two are almost superimposable in how similar that they are. So at the end of this reaction, we've made succinyl-CoA. Again, we've removed the last two carbons of acetyl. That means we've gotten rid of all of the carbons from uh, the glucose that we consumed. And these reactions, these two oxidative decarboxylation reactions, are irreversible in the cell. And so the citric acid cycle is essentially blocked from going in reverse. These are non-reversible reactions. Another side point to make here that's somewhat interesting. The carbon dioxides that we are losing in the citric acid cycle are not exactly the same exact carbons that were consumed from glucose. Instead, we kind of get a round robin going where the carbons that we harvest from acetyl are used to regenerate oxaloacetate for the next pass of the citric acid cycle. That gets pretty abstract, so let me see if I can describe it with pictures. Imagine that these four blue circles represent the four carbons of oxaloacetate. And in step one of the citric acid cycle, in comes acetyl, giving us six carbon citrate. So these two red circles are the carbons from acetyl. And the whole molecule now is a six carbon molecule citrate. You've probably been expecting, and I've almost been saying it as though, the first carbon dioxide we lose through the decarboxylation in step three is a carbon from here, the first carbon of acetyl. And the second carbon we lose that we just talked about here in step four is the second carbon of acetyl. That's not entirely true. Instead, the decarboxylation in step three results in a carbon loss that was a carbon from oxaloacetate. And then in step four, as we decarboxylate again, we lose another carbon that was previously part of oxaloacetate. The rest of the citric acid cycle will be used to regenerate oxaloacetate, and that oxaloacetate will be made using these four carbons, but you can see two of those four carbons are new and were harvested from acetyl. One more pass of the citric acid cycle, we take on a new acetyl, we've made citrate, step four, a decarboxylation, step three, a decarboxylation, not in that order, of course, and we can regenerate oxaloacetate from this, but we see that we still have the carbons from the acetyl that we adopted two cycles ago. It actually won't be until the third cycle where we will begin to lose those carbons that were with the first acetyl we absorbed. And so in this way, oxaloacetate is always new. The carbons that makes oxaloacetate never get old because it's always made of the newest carbons we have consumed. I think that's kind of interesting how we don't ever get old oxaloacetate molecules because we keep refreshing it with carbons from the environment, carbons from the foods that we are eating. In any event, step four of the citric acid cycle brings us here. Alpha ketoglutarate has been oxidatively decarboxylated into succinyl-CoA. 
Again, that means that we've lost the last carbon from the uh, glucose that we've eaten. This is our fifth and sixth carbon that are lost. And more importantly, we have reduced NAD to NADH plus H, the mobile electron carrier that can bring those electrons and protons to the electron transport chain. So we're all done with the glucose that we've consumed. The rest of the citric acid cycle is pretty much dedicated to regenerating oxaloacetate. And that's not entirely true because you can see that we're going to make that ATP along the way and we're actually going to steal some more electrons as well. So we're not done harvesting energy, but at least we're done with our extra carbons. And really, we just have to take 4-carbon succinate and convert it into 4-carbon oxaloacetate so that we can repeat this process again. So step one of the citric acid cycle to summarize is accepting or absorbing acetyl from acetyl-CoA transferring it to oxaloacetate through a condensation reaction which yields citrate. Step two of the citric acid cycle is the isomerization of that citrate to isocitrate leading us to step three, our first of two oxidative decarboxylation reactions where citrate is oxidized to alpha ketoglutarate and carbon dioxide is released as a result. Step four is catalyzed by a complex that is very much like the PDC and it is our second oxidative decarboxylation, where alpha-ketoglutarate is made into succinyl-CoA, but again, we lose carbon dioxide and we gain electrons along the way of that reaction. So far, we have reduced a total of three NAD molecules to NADH plus H, harvesting six electrons, since each NAD can carry two electrons each, and we've released three carbon dioxide molecules, one from the PDC itself, and one from step three and one from step four of the citric acid cycle. If we realize that we have done all of this twice over for every molecule of glucose we've consumed, then six carbon dioxide molecules have been lost, corresponding to the six carbons of glucose that were consumed. So we will finish up the citric acid cycle in the next lecture, lecture 14. We'll take the first chunk or so to finish up the reactions of the citric acid cycle itself, and then much as we did for glycolysis, we'll spend the rest of the time of that lecture talking about the regulation of the citric acid cycle, how and when the cell turns the cycle up and down, either increasing or decreasing electron harvesting. Until then, and as always, thanks so much for watching.